Yeah. We can hear you very well. Thanks. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Secondly, uh, thank you very much for the organizer because uh, to accommodate my talk in the second session because I have a mistake reading the program and I was preparing my talk for tomorrow sessions. But so I appreciate very much and my apologies also for to the audience to to change my talk. So the topic that I want to talk today is, as as Michel said, this activation of students' peer knowledge for learning the third Newton laws through a predict, observe, and explain strategy. And this is uh, with the mind of uh, teaching this to secondary students, so students to from 12 to uh, 18 uh, years old. Uh, so the idea is to rethink how we use uh, lab experience, laboratory hands-on experience in the teaching of uh, science, in that particular case from the physics, uh, how we use uh, the lab experience. So traditionally, uh, we use this lab experience as verification experience. So usually the teacher teaches the theory, then he do some exercises, practical exercise, and then the students go to the lab to verify verify uh, with hands-on experience what uh, they were taught during the class. So the idea is now try to use also the lab experience to introduce new uh, concepts, scientific concepts in the teaching of science. So, and this is the framework where we are, we are trying to do this is in this constructivist approach for the learning where the teaching is very focusing students' interests. The learning is, has to have active role in the learning. They learn by interaction with environment and people, but especially the free aspect of the constructivist uh, point of view that we want to focus now is that learning means uh, internal reorganization of the mental framework of students, uh, that it's very important to have the prior knowledge as a starting point for the teacher, uh, for, for learning all the students. And also that as, as bigger the conflict uh, with the prior knowledge, this trigger a more significant learning of the students. So we use POE PO strategy, prediction, observation, explanation strategy to enhance this free aspect of this constructive uh, approach of teaching and science. So the idea is to flip the order uh, of lab activities. So maybe, so the question, open question will be maybe is we can create more significant learning if we put the lab experience at the beginning of our uh, activity of teaching. Um, use labs, hubs on activities to introduce new scientific concepts could improve the activation of prior knowledge, the abstract thinking and the scientific argumentation. So the P prediction, observation, explanation strategy has three steps. So the first one is uh, prediction. So without any previous explanation of the new concepts of uh, teaching and science, uh, we ask our students to um, predict the outcome of a potential theoretical result of experiment. We do this to um, detect alternative and wrong ideas of misconceptions that the students have in mind, and also to activate their prior knowledge because it has been proved that activating prior knowledge also helps to engage uh, students and also to create more significant learning later on. Then the next step, we go to the lab to do these theoretical experiments that students predict. We go to the lab to really do a hands-on experiments, um, especially train observation, but scientific observation. So this is... Uh, Pay, play a special focus in critical thinking, in, in abstract thinking. So the, the students should be, should be able to see more than objects. Uh, they should be able to see vectors, energies, forces. So try to, uh, the, the, the teacher has to be a very important role, um, encourage the students uh, in, in see far below just uh, what they observe, right? And then there is the last um, step of this strategy is that they should work in the explanation of what they observe. This will enhance scientific argumentation and scientific reasoning 
um, also abstract thinking. And it's very important in this strategy that the explanation should not only explain what they observe, but they also have, uh, it's very important to uh, that they work in contra-argumentation of their wrong predictions. So they should be able to explain what they observe, but they should be able also able to explain why some of their predictions were wrong. That will uh, help create this change, conceptual change that constructive approach of learning um, look for uh, and create this uh, reorganization of mental in, internal mental frameworks. Um, um, in the end of the day, what we are looking is uh, new knowledge, new competence, and more significant learning. But if you want to do this uh, prediction, observation, explanation strategy, uh, not all experiments works. So we have to rethink about what experiments we are using. We cannot use the same kind of experiments that we were using for verification of what the teacher was uh, teaching in the theory. Uh, so it's necessary to uh, rethink all these new experiments and design new experiments. So uh, our hypothesis is that the, the, the best experiments that work in the POE strategy are counterintuitive experiments. So this is what we believe it work better. And the reason is because as more counterintuitive experiments are, a higher conflict with the prior knowledge of the students uh, occurs the more internal mental arrangements are needed to explain and to understand the experiments, more abstract thinking and scientific argumentation also are needed, and this will enhance the higher uh, significant learning of the students. So uh, we did uh, some pilot experiments in the teach of the of the Newton's uh, law of motion. So just for remembering. So the first law uh, talk about that anybody that remains in motion or in rest, if there is no force that applied to him, uh, to it. The second law is just uh, the calculation of the, the force is uh, the mass uh, multiplied by the um, acceleration. And the third law uh, probably is the more unpopular law uh, or not more popular is that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction um, to it, right? Um, um, and if you see uh, the textbooks of teaching physics for secondary students, you will you see repeatedly the same kind of examples to teach the third law. You probably see uh, examples of a person that jumps out of the boat, which is in the sea, to the lamb, um, and that provokes that the also the boat moves move, moves back. And also you can see that uh, a very typical example also is that you are with um, uh, a pipe with water. So the the, the, the water pulls back uh, uh, the pipe to you. Um, so we see a problem in the teaching of um, the third law because it, because we are using always the same kind of example that it looks like the third law only apply to this particular example. But the very important thing about the third law is that it happens always. In every single force in the nature, it has an opposite force in the opposite directions. So, okay, so we want to apply a prediction, observation, explanation, a strategy to teach the third law. So uh, the first step is prediction. So very important thing about the first step is that POE strategy shouldn't be advertising advice to students. So we shouldn't tell the students, okay, today we will, we will do a POE strategy because that uh, make students um, aware that uh, it will the questions to predict probably will be tricky. So that uh, make things more difficult to detect alternative ideas. So our suggestion is that this, the prediction should be presented undercover among other questions and without tell the students that we are doing a prediction observation explanation activity, right? So we just go to the school, to the class and say, okay, today let's answer that questions and without any previous explanations, right? Because the goal is that we want to detect alternative ideas and make conscientious. So if the students think that the question are already tricky, 
they will overthink too much the questions and probably you know you will the, the teacher will not detect these alternative ideas so let's show you an example of that so this is the prediction step to teach the uh, teaching of the uh, third newton's laws so you see that the important question that we want to 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 make to the students is the last one but this last question is somehow covered over other important but trivial but not trivial questions for instance does a scale a bath, bath, bathroom scale show the same more or less weight if they are stayed on one foot comparing if you are stepping on the scale with two foot so they have to answer that questions uh and, and, and this is a simple question, I will say. Okay, the next one is a little more complicated for students. So if you step on a scale on the moon, will the scale indicate the same weight? Uh, so that's require more thinking for them. But still, we are not interested in that question. These are just questions to don't put the focus on the last one. So the third one is, it, would your mass on the moon be the same that on Earth? So these two questions are related in the sense that distinguish between the concept of mass and the concept of weight, which some of the students still uh, think that is the same thing, but it's not. So, and the last, uh, the fourth question is, does the scale show the same value if you lean on a frame or if you lean on the, on, on the wall? So that's also that they have to think. And finally, we ask the important question, which is, is the scale showing the same uh, value if you stand on the scale on a tiptoe? So that's the really question that we want to ask them. Mostly of the students uh, say that yes, if you stand on tiptoe, uh, the, way, the scale will show the same value. Okay, this is, and this is other set of um, questions that we are asking to teach the, the, the third Newton's law. So the first question, again, is, is, not very, is not important for this strategy, but we are asking about how a, a sail ship can sail uh, when the wing is against it. So it's, I'm, I'm usually students know that some uh, sail ships come, even if the wing, the wing is against them, they can go forward. Uh, and we are asking here about this kind of question. So you see, this is not trivial questions, but are not important for our purposes. So this question is not exactly related with uh, the third Newton's law. But the second question, yes, this we are very interested in their prediction about this one. So the question is, okay, imagine that you have a big, a giant fan on the back of the boat, and the, the fan is pushing air against the sail. And the question is how the sail will move. And we are very interested about this question because uh, it is directly related with the third Newton's law. And then we go to the second step of this uh, strategy. We are going to the lab and we, we will do the observation step. Um, and we were able, okay, we did not, create a sail ship, but we did some car, a toy car, where we put a fan uh, on it. Um, so when we connect the fan, the fan will connect, will push air to the sail. And then uh, let's see, I mean, they, they have to see what happens, right? So, and they are very surprised, usually, they are very surprised that the, uh, the, the toy car does not move at all. So there is no movement in this kind of experiment. The other thing that they are very surprised is when they put, they stand on the scale on tiptoes, uh, the scale seems to look to become crazy. So the needle started to move like crazy. Um, and this is something that they usually never predict. So they're kind of surprised. Okay, so now they have these two contradictive experiments. They, they have to explain. So they come experimentate with them during one hour uh, and they have to think why this car don't move and why the scale became crazy when we put 
we stand on it on a tiptoes. That's the two tasks that uh, they have to do during one hour, and they can manipulate the experiment whatever they want. Actually, something that we recommend to do as well is uh, if you take the scale and you go to elevator in the building, so you can they can detect very well that when the elevator starts to go up, also the uh, scale become crazy and it started to mark different values. And when they are reaching the higher level of the building, also became crazy again. And this is something that we encourage them today to do the manipulation. And this is some of the things that they have to explain, right? Okay, so the reason, uh, I mean, the explanation is very related with the third Newton's law. For instance, in the case of the, uh, of the fan is pushing the air, but also the air is pushing the fan back. So, and this, uh, and this force that the air pushing the fan is equal to the force that the air push uh, the, the sail. So uh, both forces uh, uh, cancel to each other. And finally, there is no force applying to the car. That's, that's, that's why the car does not move. Actually, they usually detect that when they turn the fan on the other direction and they notice that the car start to move forward. Uh, similar kind of things, uh, similar thing, similar way of rationing is the uh, the scale on the elevator. So when uh, the elevator start to move up, there is accelerator acceleration. So that means that it's an extra force that is pushing the elevator up, uh, and the elevator push the scale also up. So uh, that's the reason why uh, uh, the um, scale show a different value when we are going up in elevator. It's, it's, it's quite uh, significant the fact that during the way that we are going up in the elevator, there is no acceleration and there is no extra force. So the, the scale mark the correct value. It's only on the time that we started to move and we start, uh, we stop moving when there is acceleration, there is a force, and then the scale show a different value. So. We use these uh, experiments to uh, show that uh, the third law occurs always. And always means always in all the nature and all, all, um, all uh, experiments that we can do. So for instance, it's, it's very easy for them to imagine that if you have two magnets, uh, they detect very well that they, if you leave two magnets that they have attraction, when you leave it, they will move very fast one to the other. And if they have the same mass, they will reach at the middle. But it's very surprising for them, the fact that also in gravitational forces, they apply the first Newton's laws. That means that uh, when apple falls from a tree, uh, there is a, a gravitational force that at the, uh, attracts the uh, apple to the earth. But it's very surprising for them that the, it's true that the, the apple falls to the air, but the air also falls to the tree, to the apple. And this is a very contradictory figure that demonstrate, but demonstrate that the um, third Newton's laws applies always. Actually, in class, you usually make the calculation of how much the air falls to the apple. Uh, and, and it's very easy to calculate. Um, um, it's less than a million of part of a electron. So it's a very tiny, tiny <laughs> amount. Um, even quantum mechanics could, will tell us that it's not significant, right? But uh, uh, in theory, the, the apple fall to the air and the air fall to the apple. So we did a pilot experience uh, doing this um, strategy with uh, students from uh, the master of education. So this is, older students at secondary school, so they are univer after university uh, degree. All of them have a scientific background, but we did this experiment without any explanation of the, any, any remembering of the fifth uh, Newton's law. Uh, and we did some tests. So both experiments seems to work very well uh, uh, providing contraintuitive results, outcomes, because very few of them 
predict the exact um, the exact result of the experiments. For instance, with the scale, only five percent of them predict the core value. Um, um, about the farm, the experiment with the farm and the sail ship, only 16 16 percent of them provide the core value. Uh, then we also ask them if these experiments, after all, are they think this they are useful to teach the the second uh, Newton's laws. Um, um, 95% of them agree that the sail ship is very useful. It was very visual for them and was very shocking for them. I'm surprised that the car did not move and they have to think about it. One, uh, let me propose to, to, to go uh, uh, more quickly because three minutes left from okay. the presentation. So, I know. So... I know. Okay. That's it. So the, the next step that we want to go is just... Uh, test this PO with the secondary students, these are new quantitative experiments to introduce other scientific concepts. So we are thinking in center of mass, momentum of inertia, flotability, uh, and also to introduce visual argumentation tools as Godwin V to test efficiency to enhance scientific resonance, uh, resonance of, his, of secondary students. And, and that's it. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm, I'm happy to get any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for part of this presentation. And, uh, there are questions or some remarks from the audience. I would like to ask a question <laughs> to Juan. Uh, Juan, um, when uh, when you say these percentages uh, you mentioned, to how many master students? Have you tested that? Yes, yeah, it's very few. It's, it's uh, 25. Students. Okay. And um, I guess, are you planning to use the same experiments also with the secondary school students for the third Newton's law or? Yeah, this is what we are doing, carrying mm -hmm. out right now. We still have okay. some tests, but it's not enough. Very few, even, mm -hmm. even lower statistics, but this is what we are doing now. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know in, 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 in that case, perhaps, uh, I don't know if you have thought of having also a control group, uh, in um, which means to have students that will be taught the third the Newton's law in the traditional way and then do verification or whatever, and then uh, uh, do some uh, um, uh, in order to evaluate how much better mm -hmm. you are achieving with the constructivist approach. The results usually seem to be better of course but uh, um, uh, I think it will be more interesting uh, also for the scientific point of view to know how much better you achieve uh, via constructivism relative to the traditional approach of course you do more but how much better mm -hmm. so I don't know if you have it in mind um, just in case you want to um, I don't know, publish these results or something. Uh, uh, it's good if you also have some control group um, and you don't need to apply it in, I don't know, a hundred students. Um, in that case, you can do a shorter, shorter, smaller groups, uh, not 10, but okay, uh, yeah. 25 or 30 students in one group and in the other group and compare. Um, Good. Uh, so I don't know if uh, uh, if you think of doing that. Uh, it's just a suggestion. We, yeah, we are thinking to use a control group. We are having troubles designing which are the right questions that we have to mm -hmm. ask them mm -hmm. for to be significant for both both groups, the control and the real experimental group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we are thinking we are considering control groups. And of course, you have to use the same instrument for evaluating. Exactly. The knowledge um, before and after, or only after, perhaps. Uh, and uh, be careful of the teams that you choose so that they are more or less equivalent uh, with two different. But okay, I guess I, I'm sure you will take uh, into account all these issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, other than that, I think it's uh, obviously it's <clears throat> traditional constructivist theory, and um, it's always very important to test uh, how much better we can do via, uh, via this. Um, 
and uh, your approach is really very good. Thanks. Thanks. Very cool. Okay. Thank you, Juan. Uh, 